Okay, can everybody hear me? Somebody unmute themselves. We can hear you. Okay, gotcha. thanks. Can you uh, see the picture of the intubation box? Yep. Okay, perfect. Yep. Okay, so Dr. Wasserman is here. I don't know if Jeff has made it yet. No, he hasn't. How'd you, how you do that? Why is that so loud? Oh. oh. Okay, no, I'm, I'm not. Sorry. I'm going to unmute everybody. And then, uh, Dr. Wasserman, if you can unmute yourself. Okay, so we're going to. We're going to start. Um, I don't have a lot today, and I spoke with Jeff a few minutes ago. He didn't really have much, uh, but he said he is going to sign on. Just a couple things that we have operationally is the uh, our N95 mask usage is, um, I guess the correct term would be unsustainable. We uh, we used 80 N95 masks just on RMC alone yesterday, and we received a total of 240 masks. Uh, for an entire week last week in replacement from the county. So if at all possible, consider reusing your masks. We issued the full face visors, um, which should protect the N95 masks. We also received a bunch of the cotton um, masks that go over the N95 masks, like the um, different color fabric ones we issued. So those are going out. I thought they went out already to the RPS stations, but they only went out to the RMC. But those will be going out today and tomorrow. Angel said he'll get them out. So those are designed not in replace a uh, replacement for an N95 mask, but just to uh, go over the mask to protect it. So here's Jeff now. So as long as the mask is um, protected, not contaminated, not torn, consider reusing if at all possible because you know, I'm getting, we're getting to the point where, you know, within the next week or so, we're going to start uh, running very low on supplies. And I don't want to get to the point where we have to issue, you know, uh, a single mask to, you know, one person to use for the entire day. Um, so let's just do what we can. And, you know, dispatch is now talking to all the crews on the RMC side as they come in, just to reinforce the fact that if we could use, reuse a mask that we should. Um, hey, Brian. Yeah. I think one of the, I was going to talk about that today. I think what the issue really is there is on the PPE report when they're doing a call, they're putting it down that they're using it, not as much as using it and throwing it out. So if you guys that are listening or hear the recording, and I'll send an email out about that. On the PPE report, you, you don't, if you're just using your mask and you're going to reuse it, you don't have to put down an N95 each time you're with the patient. So it, like, like Frank said in his email, if you need to use it and it gets contaminated and then you use another one, mark that on the PPE report. But if you're just using your one throughout the day on your patients, uh, you don't have to mark that down each time. Obviously your gloves, uh, you put that in. If it's a gown that you used and threw out, put that in. But if the N95 is being used on multiple patients or patient encounters throughout the day, you don't have to mark that each time. So Angel did say that he get issued 80 masks yesterday. So that, that number didn't come from the uh, burn report. So he said that he put out four boxes of 20 masks yesterday on the RMC side and they're all gone. So just, again, some of them could be on the ambulances and maybe not used, but just to, you know, keep in mind is whenever we can, you know, reuse to try to reuse, you know, as long as it's not endangering yourself or your patients or anything like that. Um, so again, we have those. No Yes, good. No, Frank, I was just going to say, we've been reusing our N95 masks for several weeks in the hospital. I mean, not the same mask, obviously, but um, we were uh, severely short. Um, so, like, since, I don't know, the beginning of March, maybe the middle of March, essentially, we were reusing masks in between patients. The biggest thing I think that um, the EMS providers have to keep um, aware of is uh, there's a wearing a mask, especially an N95 mask all the time is very difficult. Um, there's an inclination to pull the mask down or put it under your chin or, or whatever. Um, that mask potentially is contaminated on the outside. Um, so if you pull your mask down, you put it under your chin in between calls or whatever, you take it off and you throw it on the seat of the ambulance in between calls, um, you're potentially reintroducing microbes to your face um, that and you can get infected very easily that way. So, if you are going to use masks on, 
uh, all day. Try, try to leave the mask on as much as possible. Don't manipulate it. Don't take it off. Put it under your nose or under your mouth. Um, because every time you put it back on, you could just be directly inoculating yourself with viruses or even bacteria. Uh, um, so just be careful with that. Okay. Um, Jeff, do you have anything to add to the mass situation? Yeah, you know, like Adrian said, same thing that, you know, the highest risk of contaminating yourself, right, is when you don and doff PPE. So leaving it on, you're okay. Most people actually contaminate themselves removing it. So you need to be careful with that. You, should, you know, good hand hygiene, make sure you're washing your hands before and after you remove it. Leave it on if you can. It's very uncomfortable to wear an N95 all day. Um, what other people have been doing, if you have a sufficient supply of the regular surgical masks, is that a lot of our staff are wearing a regular surgical mask over top of the N95 to try and protect it from some of that contamination and then changing those masks more frequently. You don't always have those available either. Um, and then if you're gonna take it off and you're gonna store it, you wanna get like a paper like lunch bag to keep it in. Obviously you don't wanna seal it in a plastic bag because that's gonna you know, uh, make the contamination risk worse. So um, I, unfortunately we have to reuse some of this stuff because there's not enough for every single call. Uh, but just be careful in taking it off. Okay. So anybody have any, anybody have any questions on that? Okay. So the, the uh, other, you go ahead, Scott. Uh, is uh, spraying the mask with alcohol or anything like that beneficial or no, does that, help at all? No, that can no. actually Don't spray it. Mask. Yeah, it'll destroy no. it. So there's been actually some research on um, how to how to sterilize your mask. Um, I mean, from an industrial standpoint, I don't know if you have any of this um, to sterilize medical equipment. Um, you could potentially do, you know, moderate heat. I think it's up to 165 for uh, a period of 30 minutes would sterilize the mask. And we're doing that actually in our own central supply. I don't know if you have access to that. Also, ultraviolet light um, can do it. I read a hack. Um, online about like if you have a crock pot, um, you could heat the crock pot up on low. It it's it yep. heats up to about a, a 165 degrees. No water, keep it covered. Leave it in there for half an hour. That might be a viable solution. But anything super high heat, you may um, damage the mask, damage the elastic. Um, you certainly don't want to spray any chemicals on it, whether that be uh, alcohol or even getting it wet. Water is not advisable from the manufacturer. Uh, but there is some there are some interesting hacks out there that may be safe. Um, even like if you purchase a um, one of these UV um, sterilizers, you can get a small UV sterilizer. You know ones that they use like in uh, nail salons and such. Um, that's a potential way to sterilize your mask as well. I guess there are cell phone ones too. I don't know if they're big enough to fit a mask in. There. The other poor man's hack that some people have been doing is uh, you know when you drive around in the truck, if you do take it off sticking it on the dashboard in the sun, right? And when you're out of the truck, theoretically, the direct sunlight and the, how warm it gets inside a vehicle when it's, uh, when, you know, from the greenhouse effect that that might be helpful. No one really knows if that works, but I've seen some people trying that also. Okay, anything else on, uh, on our-, our don't, don't, tr don't try to put it in a microwave, actually. A lot of people yeah. have done that. And there's metal in these masks over the nose of the bridge, so don't put it in a microwave. <laughs> okay. Okay, anything else, guys? So the other thing is uh, Dr. Wasserman actually showed me this uh, intubation box device that uh, they're using in the hospitals and stuff. So I contacted a, uh, a company that was made us some for free. The issue we have, obviously, it, when it's fused together uh, as a box is there's no room really in the trucks or the ambulances for it. So they made us a, um, a knockdown version that we could assemble and use. So we were playing with it yesterday to see how quickly we could assemble it. And in the process, we actually broke one. <laughs> um, so I reached out to them again. They said that in a knockdown version, they used the thinnest plexiglass they could to keep the weight down because they thought the weight would be important for us. Um, they're going to try to remake them now uh, a little thicker for us. Um, so I do have six of them. I'm going to probably uh, show it to Ryan and Bo and see what they think about it, if it has any use to, to um, put out there on the trucks. But the concept basically, like you see in the picture, um, is that it would go over the patient's head. This way it would protect you from any, you know, hopefully any droplets and you would reach through. The other suggestion I made to them was 
like this picture has where there's holes uh, made in the side of it. The one we have does not have any holes in the side. It just has holes in the front. So they said that they would, uh, they would experiment with that too. So if, you know, if it, if it looks like it's a good idea, we'll definitely put them out. And if it looks like it's a good idea, we'll also get them for the, uh, for the ambulances. Frank. So, yes. What, one, so a couple of things we're seeing. So we're using the same thing at NIAC and it's great for an in-house in the hospital kind of solution. Uh, but what we're seeing a lot of people doing is using just plastic, clear plastic sheets. Like you would get like a heavy, like drop cloth for painting that's plastic. And then what you can do is you can cut these sheets to like the stretcher size and you can make slits where your hands would go and then tape those slits with like duct tape and then they become sturdy like handholds. And you can just kind of roll it out over the patient and intubate underneath it uh, if you need to, because obviously you'll be providing oxygen via mask underneath there as well. Um, and a lot of places are trying that as well. And then the other thing I would say is minimize these opportunities to intubate whenever possible. So again, in cardiac arrest, we know that the evidence suggests that supraglottic airway is just as good or better in cardiac arrest to begin with. Why would you take the risk of intubating a cardiac arrest patient? You should be going directly to a supraglottic airway. Okay, so we'll work on those uh, those sheets. I mean, I, there, I was just looking on the internet. There's actually a some softer versions, like almost like a little pop-up tent version that goes over yeah. it, but we'll look at some different uh, And then different I'll send you, I think I have someone sent out a template to like where the hand holds you go to make those sheets. Okay. Okay, so any questions on, you know, protecting ourselves if we do choose to intubate, which obviously, you know, Jeff said that we should go into the King Airways instead. Anything on that? Okay, um, so that's the two things I had. So I'm just going to see, I think maybe just to retouch on the cardiac arrest pronouncements and stuff like that, because we've had some situations um, during the week. So I'll turn that over to Jeff and to Adrian. Yeah. So, you know, we've had some, there's been some that have been challenging. So I got a call yesterday working medical control that, um, you know, for a 29 year old that you know, it's a young, healthy person, right? That's a very terrible situation, tough situation to be in. But, you know, as the medic said, they, they were in assistly, they were in assistly when they got to the scene. Um, you know, it was unclear how long the downtime was. They did work them, you know, three rounds and, you know, 20 minutes or so, but then they called and, and we did feel terminate because regardless of their age at that point, you know, there's really being asystolic for that long and multiple attempts at ACLS, there really was nothing more that could have been done by transporting them to the hospital. So I know these are tough situations for people to be in. Uh, and sometimes those conversations with the family can be tough too. That's why I did send out, I don't know if people got it. I sent out that video that Maya Dorset up in Syracuse produced on how to, it's like a 30 minute video on how to have some of these conversations with family and stuff. And, you know, some reflections from paramedics on dealing with that. So um, if people didn't get it, I can send it again, but that might be helpful uh, to look at. Uh, but overall, I think people have been following the protocol fairly well. And um, we have not seen a lot of cardiac arrests being transported. Yeah, we, um, we I had one last week and I, I, I have to be honest, I don't know if the paramedic was uh, RPS or from another company. Um, it was a, an elder, very elderly individual, I wanna say over 90 years old. They had a DNR, the patient was from home. They had a DNR, um, family was on the scene, uh, but the family wanted the DNR rescinded. Um, and the after the patient had become uh, it wasn't asystolic, just in respiratory distress in, in some fashion. Um, and so they, res they, for whatever reason, without calling medical control, they disregarded a patient's DNR that, that was there um, because the family wanted everything to be done at that point in time, which I thought was probably not the best decision. They intubated this patient. Um, the patient came in. Um, they arrived, they're bagging the patient. There was no cover over the patient. Um, and they just walked in bagging the patient. Um, so again, potentially spreading virus um, to as they walked in. And then as soon as they put the patient in the room, um, the ED physician came in and noticed that the patient was asystolic. So the patient had obviously arrested in route or soon after arrival, and they had arrested anyway. So I just thought it was kind of a, just the all around, you know, we could think about maybe better decision making in that case. Um, obviously, there's a lot of emotional 
stuff going on. People are dying at home, more people than ever. Um, families may be inclined to say no, do everything. Um, but if there are advanced directives in place that the patient had signed, um, we should respect those. And if there's any question, then please reach out by medical control and speak to the physician on duty. Um, I'm sure Jeff would agree as well. Yeah, for any of those situations, like we had one uh, yesterday as well, where we were able to get a nursing home to cancel the, the situation and not transport the patient, right? So they went, it was Nyack Ridge, and the patient happened to be 95 years old with a DNR, DNI, who, you know, the SATs, they got there, the SATs were in the 60s. Okay, you know, they put them on a breather, the SAT only came up to 85, but they were DNR, DNI, and in, in talking with the staff at the nursing home and then figuring out who that doctor was and talking to them, we were able to then cancel that transport and keep the patient at the nursing home. So, you know, definitely let us help you if we can. Uh, we know that it's a difficult situation sometimes in the field and that you're dealing with staff at a nursing home or family sometimes who, you know, don't want to hear what you're saying or, or maybe somewhat unreasonable in, in those, at those end of life moments. But whatever we can do to help prevent the, you know, needless transports and then exposing you guys to risks that you don't need, the better. Can, can, a, um, can a family member rescind a DNR for a patient? I guess if they're the proxy, they can, right? Yes. So, you know, obviously if the person's a DNR and then whoever the decision maker of the family is, right? So whoever, whether that's a spouse, a child, a parent, whatever, they can rescind the DNR, um, you know, which unfortunately happens sometimes, right? We all know the person codes and they're just not ready for it. And they can't deal with it. They want everything done. A lot yeah. of times we can talk them down from that decision. Sometimes we can't. But if the patient, if the patient signed a DNR, 10 years ago or five years or whatever last year and says, I do not want to be resuscitated and then lists someone else as their healthcare proxy. You're really going against the patient, the patient's wishes, you know, could the patient signed that DNR when he or she was in a right state of mind and he, that those were his or her wishes. Um, and to have someone come in uh, and you know, say, no, I'm rescinding the DNR. I don't respect what my father wanted or whatever. I mean, I think that just goes against the, the letter of medical ethics. You know, the patient has the right to make their own decision. When they become incapacitated, it's not appropriate for the family member to go behind and say, no, we don't, we don't right. think he was making the right decision. And as physicians, what we've been doing in those situations, especially, again, like Adrian said, if it was a recent DNR in the last couple of years or so, they, that clearly was their wish, is that we're telling the families that we're going to honor that wish and it would be medically futile to attempt to resuscitate yeah. them. We just have two physicians sign that, you know, where there's, there's no medical value in proceeding with trying to resuscitate them and that we're honoring the patient's wishes. So, so in the field, we're presented with somebody who has a valid healthcare proxy, right? And they're saying, you know, that legally gives them the right to make decisions for that unconscious patient. Um, what do we do? So do yeah, we so that's a little different. So if it's a healthcare proxy, right, they don't have a signed DNR, but they have a proxy, then that proxy has decision-making ability and whatever they decide to do is what they decide to do. No, but it's I'm saying there is a DNR, oh, okay. but there's also a proxy. There's a, somebody who's the proxy present and they're saying to disregard the so DNR. So the best thing I can suggest there is to um, call medical control and let us speak with that person. Okay. Because yeah. that, that is happening where, you know, not, not just random, you know, family in, in grieving make a decision, a poor decision, yeah. but they actually have a legal document saying they have the right to make the decision. So does anybody have anything they want to talk about as far as... On, that, on the healthcare proxy thing, one other thing. So most states, and, and, and when it's taken to court, would say that, yeah, healthcare proxy can make decisions on the behalf of someone when they're incapacitated. But if that person had expressed clear wishes prior to that point then even the courts tend to go with that and not what the healthcare proxy says because that person actually expressed their wishes prior to incapacitation and that the whole purpose of a healthcare proxy is really to make decisions when that person is no longer capable of making decisions for themselves. I, I have a question. Ed, Rob? Yes, Rob. Okay. I'm on Rich's phone. I see that. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, read Rich's autograph, by the way, you know, all this love night appearances. I know, I know. Isn't that always the case? Um, so my question is for you and Dr. Wasserman, um, as far as these patients who are exhibiting signs of MI, but they're actually COVID patients, 
Um, if we do a 12 lead EKG and it's not a STEMI, um, I would assume you're going to want us to continue in ALS with these people. Um, and my question really is, is it okay to give them aspirin or is it going to be like a rice syndrome kind of thing with the virus? I, I would say, I think the, the data, the very little data that came out about the NSAID thing um, is so preliminary. And uh, I mean, I don't, I don't buy it. I would say that, you know, the, the likelihood that you could be doing the patient good by giving them aspirin, it would far exceed, uh, exceed the, the chances that you could be doing something dangerous to them um, by not giving them or by giving them aspirin and causing some, you know, potential issue with COVID. I, I don't know how Jeff feels, but I don't, I don't buy the early research. I think there's, we're talking, you know, decades of research on aspirin and MIs and a couple weeks of research on um, NSAIDs and COVID. Yeah, I agree completely. And what we're learning about COVID too is that it definitely there's microthrombi and there's thrombotic events and a lot of these people have very elevated D-dimers and that. So an antiplatelet agent, I think would be totally fine in that situation. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, uh, Pace had a question, Jeff, about it. So in that situation where we have, um, um, a DNR, and then we have a proxy that's telling us to disregard the DNR, and then we're calling medical control. He asked, us, should they be doing CPR while they're waiting for determination from medical control on what to do? Um, probably. I, I wouldn't use the term slow code or anything like that, but probably you should initiate until you can get medical control on the phone. Okay. Any other questions from anyone or any discussion on the yeah. cardiac arrest in the field? I had a quick question about a clinical question about um, an arrest we did last week, if I could. <clears throat> okay. Um, so we had we had a, a, a guy that was in refractory VFib that we worked for 20 minutes and ultimately did a termination while he was still in VFib. We had a superglottic airway in place and we put a surgical mask over the airway just for additional protection. And we were getting very high end pedals, like in the high 50s. Um, and I kept, I kept like double checking to make sure we weren't getting ROSC because of that end title. And my partner and I were talking about it after the fact, trying to figure that out. And we were just wondering if it was because we had a surgical mask over the supraglottic airway that was causing such high end titles. Like we can't figure anything else out about it. Yeah. I mean, I would say it's, it's possible that you were trapping whatever CO2 you had with the surgical yeah. mask and raising it artificially that way. Or you were saturating the mask. Yeah. Yeah. You That's guys don't have, you don't have viral filters, right? For the BBM, you can't find them anywhere? We had, and we went through them. Yeah. Yeah, we can't get any new ones. I'll, I'll talk to Angel again. I know he put a couple orders in with yeah. different vendors. I think everyone but, sold out. But. Yeah. So. Okay, so anything on cardiac arrest, pronouncements, DOAs, um, anything? Um, just Jeff and, and Adrian, um, a couple of the paramedics from New Square called me about they've seen a patients who have recovered from COVID um, developing new onset AFib. I don't know if anybody's heard that, but they've had a few now, like more than, you know, I think it's up to about five or six, they were saying people who never had AFib before, otherwise healthy, had COVID, recovered, and now have AFib. So we know that there is a certain percentage of these patients with COVID who get either a uh, cardiomyopathy as a result of it, or like, a, like you would see with other viruses, like a viral myocarditis, yeah. where there's inflammation of the heart. And you know, the inflammation of the heart can create you know, irritation of the atria and you could have AFib. Most likely it's transient. And then as that uh, myocarditis, as that resolves, that the AFib would go away too. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so do you, do you, Jeff or Adrian, do you have anything else you wanna discuss? If not, we'll just open it up to any questions anybody has? I don't have anything specific other than to say, you know, we are, it looks like we are past the peak, at least uh, here. Um, our, you know, ventilator counts are improving. We have successfully extubated about 10 patients at this point in the last week. So there is good news. And um, we are uh, discharging patients and our discharges are starting to exceed our admissions now at this point. So, you know, while we're still running five ICUs and we still have a, the highest census we've ever had, it looks like the influx is slowing a little bit, at least at least on our end here. 
Yes, same here. Same here. Okay. Um, J uh, Jessica has gotten these um, presentations up on CenterLearn with a small quiz at the end of them on what we went over. So what we're going to do is use that as a way of issuing um, medical control CME to the paramedics and also general CME for the refresher for the paramedics um, and then for the EMTs, just general CME. So right. if you want after um, the lecture, just give her a little bit of time. It takes about an hour or two for her to do all the finagling and get it up on CenterLearn, but that would be a way for you to be able to, to get CME. And we spoke with the region, um, but you have to have been on this lecture to get medical control. So if you watched it live, you would get medical control. If you watched it via the video that's gonna be on Center learn. They're saying that you're only going to get physician contact hours, not medical control. So I, I, I don't know why they said it had to be live to get medical control. If not, it's physician contact. Um, and if this works, you know, even even with the COVID stuff calming down, I think we can continue to do some live events like this. If this is a, a good way for people to get some CME who maybe can't make it to some of the other stuff. Yeah, I mean we're averaging 25 plus people on every, you know, every um, session. So I would definitely agree with you. Okay, um, so before I just ask everybody if they have any questions, Bo, I know you're on. Do you have anything you wanted to discuss? Did you want to talk about the Cardizem? Sure. Is Ryan on? Um, I did not see Yeah, him. I'm here. Okay. You, you want to go over that? You found out since we talked? Yeah, with the Cardizem. Yeah, just uh, explain where it's, yeah, what it is and where it's going to go. Okay, uh, the cardizem that we're able to find is in a powder form, uh, which is good and bad. It'll last a lot longer, so we don't need to take it out of the truck every 30 days and put new stuff in. This new stuff will last uh, at least over a year. Uh, the bad part, or the part that uh, maybe is gonna just throw a little bit of a curve to some people, is we have to reconstitute it into an IV bag. It's a pro proprietary product. Um, so in that respect, it's a little bit of a pain, but you take the uh, vial, you take the bag, you pop off the ends, you screw it on, you reconstitute it. Um, now the cardizem we're getting is 100 milligrams. Uh, so obviously we're not giving that to the patient, we're not infusing that. Can you guys so see, I'm sorry, Ryan. Into a 50, Hold on, Ryan. Can you see? Can you see? Can you see the picture of the bag now on the screen? Yes. Okay. So that's what Ryan's talking about. Okay. So you're reconstituting it in a 50 cc bag, which will give you a concentration of two milligrams per milliliter. Um, so then you're going to draw it up from the bag and administer it the same way you've always been administering it, through a syringe in the IV over two minutes. Um, so. If you need to redose them at 0.35 milligrams per kilogram, 15 minutes after your first one, you're going to go back to that same bag and draw it out of there. So your two doses could uh, uh, or will come from this bag. So you're only carrying one vial in each blue bag, and we are not going to be carrying cardizem in the orange bag anymore. That's all. Jessica, uh, Jessica is going to put the video up on CenterLearn um, and whatever other information the company has on reconstituting it up on CenterLearn. And then there'll be, a, again, a brief, you know, five, 10 question uh, quiz. So you'll be able to get CME for it, but we're also gonna, obviously everybody needs to watch it and know how to use it. And if you have any questions, then you could reach out to any of the lieutenants or FTOs or myself or Bo or anything. We'll show you how to, to do the reconstitution. Any questions on Cardizem? Going once, going twice. This isn't that difficult to do. We've had the same kind of setup in the hospital for a while. We use that product. It's not that difficult. Okay. So, are you going to have it on Center Learn as soon as it's ready, or and send out a notification like when it's the, our usual CMEs? Yeah. So the same thing that happened last week when Jessica got the uh, last last week's medical director. Um, see me up you'll get an email from center learn saying there's a new video you need to watch okay. and i'll you know i'm, I'm going to be off tomorrow and um um what's today monday tuesday wednesday and thursday so either bo will put something out or somebody will put to orion or somebody will put something out just saying it's out there 
or I'll have Jessica do it. Okay, thank you. Okay, any questions on the Cartizem? Bo, do you have anything else? Uh, no, I think that's it for today. Okay. Um, is the, the decon spraying thing still moving forward? Yep, just waiting for the product to come in. As soon as it comes in, we'll, we'll start that. Okay, so Bo has spent a lot of time and effort um, working on a method to be able to decon the ambulances, the paramedic trucks, and the stations. So again, as soon as the actual decontamination product that we'll be spraying comes in, that's something we'll also be starting to do. Okay. Just the other, thing, it, the other thing is just on the RPS side, we're close to getting the Medic 3 and Medic 5 trucks out to the station. I'm hoping within uh, sometime next week, they, they might be ready to, to go out and service. And just a comment about the PPE and decon, Frank, is that um, I know this is nobody at RPS who would do anything like this, but we have found outside the ambulance bay at Nyack a few times, uh, gowns, gloves, and, and N95 stuff was laying on the ground. We have tried to add a couple more garbage cans out there. We just ask that, you know, if you come in with the crews, if you can remind them to dispose of their PPE properly. Okay. I was, uh, I was hiking in in the woods the other day with my dog and I came across a mask yeah. in the woods. So I mean, if you go like to the supermarket, there are all of these gloves yeah. all over the ground in the parking lot. It's yeah, great. I know it's a little crazy. I don't know who was walking five miles into the woods with a mask on, but whatever. Um, okay. So I guess we're up to the point where we could open it up to, to any of the medics and EMTs. If you guys have anything you'd like to discuss with the medical directors or Bo or myself or anything like that. So unmute yourself and you know, if you have a question, uh, Frank, I, I, I just like to throw something up. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Scott. Uh, renal care in Suffern is apparently the only renal care facility that is taking COVID patients, and they are running till well past 11 o'clock at night, as we found out last night. Uh, and all the patients said they were from Congers or other areas. So, you know, if you're working 23, you might any COVID job for the renal care is definitely a positive. The center DeVita on 59 and Annuettes, all positive. So they're coming from Westchester, et cetera, coming in Annuette. Yeah. On the, uh, on the RMC side, we're seeing that some of our regular dialysis patients have, uh, have passed away from COVID. So, you know, people, I guess it's spreading, you know, and they already have, you know, obviously many medical issues, so they're not tolerating it well. Okay, so any any other things that anybody has? I've got a quick question on on proning the patients. Should we be doing that in the uh, ambulance on the way to the hospital? Is there any benefit to proning these patients? There's definitely benefit to it if the patient can tolerate it. Um, I don't know from a safety, you know, like if you're in the in the in a traveling ambulance. I don't know from a safety standpoint if that's okay to do. Um, if you can strap your patient down or whatever, but uh, Definitely benefit, definitely worthwhile to try. You could do it um, in a non-intubated patient laying on their stomach with a non-rebreather. We do it in the ER. It, it sometimes does work, so there's no harm in doing it if they can tolerate it, other than the safety standpoint. Okay. Jeff, I think Jeff's trying to talk, but he's on mute. Yeah, I was gonna say, that the issue is doing it safely, and then in the short transport time you have with them, I don't know how much of a difference it'll make. We're definitely doing it for hours at a time in the ER. Um, it, it won't hurt them, and it certainly can help. Um, you just have to make sure that you can safely transport them in that position. Okay, does anybody have anything else? Um, I just have a quick question. Can you hear me? Yeah, good, Donnie. Okay, yeah. Um, Good, no. systole patients. How long would it take for a body to be rid of their CO? I, this is going back because we had a, a, a case last week where we were not getting any readings on, on uh, the capnography on the end title. Like zero? Like zero. There was, and we, we checked both, both monitors Monitors were working fine because we looked at them afterwards, but you know, so I'm just out of curiosity, like if, if is there a, 
a specific time frame. I don't know that anyone knows yeah. a specific time frame other than under 10 is you're not going to resuscitate them. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. That's, that's all. Um, Thanks. Ray, Ray put out um, this week a, a bunch of stuff about um, behavioral health services that are available to employees, you know, dealing with this. So there is the NIAC Hospital EAP program and stuff like that. So if anybody feels, you know, that they need to talk to a professional about this or anything like that, we do have the NIAC Hospital EAP program. So you could just contact um, somebody at headquarters and I guess Nelson would be the best person. And if you can't get Nelson, Bo or myself, and we'll make sure that you um, get contact with them and it's all confidential. You know, we don't, we don't find out anything. Nelson also put out another uh, one that we found, uh, I think he put it out Sunday evening or early Monday morning. So there's also another first responder number that he sent out. Okay. And then, and then also, I think you also put out for John Scanlon's daughter was offering, uh, I think like a Zoom yoga class for kids. So he also put that out for kind of keep the kids in doing something at the house. So that was also offered to us. Okay, does anybody have any issues? Anything else that they want to discuss? Uh, somebody's trying to talk. Hold on. I'm going to unmute everybody for a second. Who, who was just trying to talk? What? No, Jessica, come in my office because you're talking in the hallway, but I can hear you from the hallway, but you're not talking on, this, on the Zoom. Jessica, come in my office. Okay. Oh my God, Ray's here with a mask on. Thank Frank for uh, setting this up and working this out. Also, want to thank uh, Dr. Raybridge and Dr. Watt. Oh, you broke the seal. Out. I have to throw it away. <laughs> out. Uh, the one thing I, I did want to mention is that uh, we should be mindful when we wear our uniforms, when we take them home. You shouldn't be going into your house with your uniform on. You should be, uh, uh, if you can, change uh, at work and put it in a bag and throw it right into the laundry and or take it off before you go into the house for shoes, et cetera, because that's been known to uh, transmit the virus also in the yeah. house. And that's the last place you want to bring it. Yeah, I would suggest that as well. Uh, that, you know, I, when I work I, in the I, ER, I, I change it to my work clothes here and then I change yeah, before I leave. And, uh, keep up the good work. Uh, there's also, today I just happened to see it, uh, Low HUD uh, did an article on RPS, so you may want to take a look at that. And that's uh, Greer and uh, Hirschfield. So it's a positive article. Thank you all. Yeah, I just want to emphasize what Ray said I'm about the changing. Get on this thing. As one of these days, I'm going to figure right. it out. Frank, send Ray back to his office. <laughs> okay, they said go back to the office. <laughs> <laughs> and put the mask uh, on your face. <laughs> yes, definitely, you know, clothing can you can be contaminated. The virus can live on clothing. We think for a while, we don't know how long, maybe a day or so. Um, that's what I do when I'm working in the ER is I, I change before I leave and then I throw that stuff right in the washing machine. So just be cognizant of that when you go home that, you know, either if you have a, a laundry room or a garage or whatever, it, you know, change before you go into the house or um, change at work before you leave so you're not contaminating things. Uh, regarding BLS, I don't know if everyone's aware, Nanuit Ambulance made a contract with SUNY Albany. So they have an ambulance here for at least three weeks doing 911 jobs. So on that same thing with BLS, New City, Congers, Stony Point, and Havistrop. I hear you. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm talking to Jessica. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, New City, Stony Point, Congers, and Havistraw have a group of eight um, EMTs from their schools down here riding all four cores trying to help fill in the schedules, make sure we can get two cores up or not. Um, so they'll be there for at least the next week, maybe the next three weeks. They were asked to give a one-week commitment. So you may, you may see some of them on, the, on those cores too. 
Okay. Anything for the medical directors? Because if not, I'm going to, you know, we can let them go to back to what they need to do and we can continue on. Anything for Dr. Raybridge, Dr. Wasserman? Going once, twice, three times. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank and you guys. Keep doing what you're doing. Okay. Thanks. Take care. Be safe. Okay. Okay. Does anybody have anything else company wise, you know, that we want to discuss? Okay, so there were a couple of questions that were asked. Um, let's see. So donning and doffing. Um, it looks like so some of the new EMTs do not know how to do it. So I will, um, I will make sure we get a video out on it. I don't think we have time to do a donning and doffing class, but I'm 99% sure there's something on the CDC website and the World Health Organization um, website on donning and doffing. So I will see what we could do with that. Um, some people were asking, um, were asking about the center learn. So for those of you that are on the live chat right now, do you have to sit through the whole video on center learn and then take the quiz? So basically you watch what you have to. So I believe right now the answer is gonna be yes but I'll work with Jessica and ask Jason Pollock if there's a way that maybe we could, you know, for the, those of you that we know sat through the live part, um, not to sit through it. The problem is that people have been logging in and out of this, you know, so I think from the state standpoint, they'd probably want to know that you, you know, were in it for the whole time, but I'll see what I could do about it. Okay. Anything else that, uh, that's about the, that's it for questions that were sent by, uh, by text. Anything else that anybody wants to go over? Okay, does everybody want to have one again next week? Is it worth to have one again next week? Yes, no? Yeah, I think it's a go. Okay. Okay, fine. So if we have nothing else, then um, everybody stay safe. Okay, and thank you again, you know, for everything that everybody's doing and we'll, uh, we'll get together. I'll work with the uh, with Jeff and Adrian to find out a date and time that's good for them and we'll put it out. Okay, so thanks. Take care, I'm gonna shut off now.